I'm very pleased to announce uh, or present uh, the next speaker, Tone Olaf Nilsson. Uh, Tone is an independent, independent curator, activist and educator based in Copenhagen. And in 2005, she formed the transnational feminist curatorial collective Curatorisk Action. And since 2010, she has worked as program coordinator for the Trampoline House, a user-driven refugee justice community center for refugees and other residents of Denmark. So, without further ado, please tune in. Thank you so much. I had way too much to eat, so <laughs> I hope I'm not going to fall asleep. <laughs> no, I'd like to uh, begin by thanking Hen and, and the rest of the organizers of Prologue 3 uh, for inviting me to come and share my work with you today. I'm really excited about being here and truly grateful to be able to, uh, to meet the other contributors uh, to this symposium. If I go too fast or too slow, uh, let me know, but otherwise, here we go. Uh, in my talk today, I will present two self-governing institutions that I've been part of founding. The first is uh, Trampoline House, a refugee justice community center located in northwestern Copenhagen. The second is the exhibition venue Camp, which, short, which, is, which stands for Center for Art on Migration Politics, an exhibition space that is located inside the Tremblin House. Both are permanent projects that are trying to respond artistically and curatorially to the political neglect of the international community to come up with sustainable responses to the challenges of displacement and migration. Briefly about myself, I am, as Marianne said, an independent activist, curator and educator based in Copenhagen. Since the late 1990s, yeah, I'm that old, <laughs> I've used curating to address the root causes of social, economic and environmental justices and uh, to present other ways of organizing the world. In 2005, I joined forces with independent curator Frederik Hansen and formed the curatorial collective Kuratorisk Action, which translates into curatorial action. We are known for having curated a series of projects engaging race and coloniality in the Nordic region. In 2015, we co-founded the camp and parallel to my work with Frederike, I was also part of establishing Trampoline House together with my partner, Morten Gold, and our program refugee internship and children and women's program coordinator in the house and has been since it opened in 2010. In short, you could say that my practice is based on a firm belief in the ability of artistic and curatorial work to contribute to social and political transformation. In 2015, terrorism allegedly hit Copenhagen when three shootings took place. The first shooting happened on February 14th during a public event titled Art, Blasphemy and Freedom of Expression. A gunman killed a civilian and wounded three police officers. The controversial Swedish artist Lars Wilks was among the speakers. He is thought to have been the main target because of his controversial Mohammed drawings. The second shooting took place later that night outside Copenhagen's synagogue. A gunman killed a Jewish security guard and wounded two police officers. The following morning, police shot and killed a suspect after he opened fire on them. The man was identified as Omar Abdel Hamid El Hussein, a 22-year-old man born in Denmark to Jordanian-Palestinian parents. Police claimed he was responsible for both shootings. Politicians and media as well as the 
politicians and media, as well as the Danish public at large, have been prompt to condemn the shootings as terrorist is Islamist attacks on Danish democracy and freedom of speech and religion. Those oppositional voices who have interpreted the shootings as the result of structural racism and social inequality in Denmark have had very little resonance. After the shootings, Swedish National Radio called me and asked for a statement due to my work on racism, migration politics and coloniality. And I told them that in my opinion, art's most important tasks at the moment are one, to examine what structures in Danish society angered and alienated El Hussein to such a degree that he resorted to killing, and two, to create real and sustainable platforms that will stimulate greater understanding, conviviality and solidarity between minority and majority communities. Trampling House and Camp make up two such <coughs> platforms, I believe. Trampling House was formed by artists, curators, asylum seekers and migration activists in reaction to the way in which the Danish state treats asylum seekers and refugees. The house is open four days a week and offers internships and job training, classes and activities, legal and medical counseling to refugees and asylum seekers all with the aim of breaking the social isolation and sense of powerlessness that many refugees and asylum seekers experience in the Danish asylum system. Trampoline House brings together asylum seekers and Danish citizens, refugees and other residents of Denmark, all united by a desire to improve the conditions for asylum seekers and refugees. Camp is an exhibition venue for art that engages questions of displacement, migration, immigration and asylum. The center works to increase insight into the life situations of displaced and migrant persons and to discuss these in relation to the overall factors that cause displacement and migration to begin with. The objective, the object, object sorry, the objective <laughs> is through art to stimulate greater understanding between displaced peoples and the communities that receive them and to stimulate new visions for a more inclusive and equitable migration, refugee and asylum policy. Trampoline House and Camp have both taken their starting point in the fact that more people than ever before are displaced from their homes because of war, conflict, persecution, climate change, or poverty. Approximately 60 million people are currently displaced from their homes because of war or persecution, and an even higher number have migrated from poverty and climate change. We're witnessing an unprecedented wave of mass migration. In 2015 alone, more than a million refugees and irregular migrants crossed into Europe, cutting open the continent's borders and creating division amongst its politicians and populations over how to deal with the influx. Fearing that newcomers will strain welfare systems, threaten security and undermine the quality of life, European governments have responded by fortifying their external borders and reforming their asylum and deportation laws. Consequently, Europe is now the world's most dangerous migration route and the Mediterranean the world's most dangerous border crossing, according to IOM, the International Organization for Migration. The large migratory and refugee flows have resulted in a whole migration management industry. Juridical and political procedures and technologies that contemporary nation states use to try to regulate transnational migration and to exclude unwanted immigrants. 
Of the 1.3 million uh, refugees reaching Europe in 2015, 21,225 made it all the way to Denmark and applied for asylum. 21,225. Out of those, only 10,573 people had their asylum case processed in Denmark. The rest were found to have no valid asylum claim and were either forcibly deported to their home country or sent back to the other European countries to have their cases pre processed there according to the so-called Dublin Regulation. People who seek asylum in Denmark or have been denied asylum and are waiting to be deported are not allowed to work, enroll in an education program or to live where they want unless they obtain special permission from the Danish Immigration Service. Instead, most of them are accommodated in remote asylum centers scattered across the country while they wait for the authorities to settle their asylum claim. In 2015, Immigration Service also established a number of deportation centers to accommodate rejected asylum seekers only. In the asylum centers, you are provided with a bed, clothes, a little pocket money every two weeks, and different activation programs. In the deportation centers, you are no longer entitled to pocket money or activation programs but live in a prison-like facility with cafeteria food three times a day. Some wait months, others years, depending on the specifics of their case or the pressure on the asylum system. But all asylum center and deportation center residents share the same burden, not knowing how long you have to stay in the asylum center as there is no maximum application processing time frame. Inside the centers, there are very few activities and very few possibilities for educational training. Scientific studies show that many grow ill from the waiting, the uncertainty, the inactivity, and from the feeling of not being able to control one's own life. Long-term stays in the centers without a resolution to your life situation actually leads to various permanent disorders. In 2013, the average stay in the center system was 1.5 years. 727 asylum seekers had waited more than 3 years and 29 had waited more than 15 years. Danish artist Nana Katrina Hansen's video Room 205 gives a very accurate representation of everyday life in the Danish asylum centers. It portrays the limbo of waiting and being criminalized and pacified for the three men living in Room 205 in Center Outstrup. And let's see if I can get it to play. Stahabrata, <laughs> 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 <laugh
filho, ele caiu o dia, ele foi. Se ele tomou uma leite azada, se ele se apareceu nele, não era como se ele garmiu nele, mas o dia que ele se apareceu nele, não apareceu nele, já não tem que ir para o lugar, e eu já tenho que ir para o lugar, e eu já tenho que ir para o lugar, e eu já tenho que ir para o lugar. Nak pada kalau isap serada sekali bila kita ada dua orang sahijin, sahijin kamu ziarah bagi ia hodir kamu. Karena ini ada yang tahu tahu dekat, ia buat sahabat yang kiri, apa mesti ada ni dalam ni. Kepala, zahni tahu orang dah sepuji kita dah masker, ia buat kepala kalau kita sahijin aku rezeki. Ia buat orang kamu kaki, kau tu yang nak jangan ia dah garazi. Nampak nak kepala tazat dah tak kena terkait juga. Ia buat kaki ni, mahu sebab tu semua. प्रॉब्लम रोहानी थी जिसे दावों से नहीं खाते जिसको मिल कर लेते हम भी दावों मारे मिल कर लेते हम भी मज़ूम मज़ूम मिल कर लेते जिस जो खुनो जो तब तंग शो है नहीं वो वो दवाई में तो तुम लोग खुलकर ते दावों वाले कर ली थी वक्त ही प्यारा वाले थे टोल आसानी तक भी ना पैदा करी बस लाग کور کی یا روح سونه کنی کنی بس ختم کی از بند و بس بر تیزه چی کم پاته زی Joshua Gambin's writings on the figure of the refugee and the structure of the camp. Danish art historian and critic Mikkel Bolt, who I believe uh, contributed to Prologue 1, um, has described the Danish asylum centers as literal camps. According to him, each one of them make up, and I quote, a point in an institutionalized, discriminative, juridical system designed to reduce the life quality of its residents." End of quote. In Mikkel Bolt's analysis, the Danish asylum system is, and I quote again, a system of forced social disintegration, the architectural manifestation of state racism. End of quote. Designed to keep the undesirables on the outside. Treblin House was, reform, uh, sorry, was formed in reaction to this racist and discriminatory system. In spring 2009, Copenhagen-based Morten Gold, Paris-based artist Joachim Hamu, and myself invited a large group of asylum seekers, socially engaged art students, asylum activists, and immigration lawyers to participate in a series of workshops that took place in two Danish asylum centers. The aim was to discuss what could be done to improve the social and political rights of asylum seekers and refugees in Denmark. The workshop's dialogical structure was a deliberate attempt to avoid speaking on behalf of asylum seekers and contributing to the continuous annulment of their agency and empowerment. Instead, the workshops were intended to be a platform from where the expert knowledge and criticisms of the camp residents could be heard and turned into alternative, sustainable solutions through creative exchanges and collaborations with art students. The collective answer in the workshops was to boycott the asylum centers and create an independent space, our own house, where the criminalization, isolation, and pacification of asylum seekers could be deconstructed. A user-involving community center where refugees, asylum seekers, forced migrants, Danish citizens, and other residents of Denmark would be able to meet, engage in activities together, exchange knowledge, and develop strategies of resistance. In November 2010, following a very tough period of fundraising and trying to keep the workshop group together, we finally raised enough funds to realize our concept. And on November 27, 2010, 
the Trampoline House open to the public in a 250 square meter big space in northern Copenhagen. In June 2014, we moved to our current space in northwestern Copenhagen, which is twice as big as the first house. Trampoline House's mission has from the beginning been to break the social isolation of refugees, asylum seekers and forced migrants in Denmark and through legal counseling, education and community provide these precarious groups with information and tools needed for them to better their difficult life situation. Secondly, to inform the Danish public about the conditions of refugees, asylum seekers and undocumented migrants in Denmark and motivate to a just, solidaristic and sustainable refugee and asylum policy. And three, to jumpstart the inclusion, inclusion of refugees awarded asylum in Danish society and help them through Denmark's three year long integration <coughs> program. Oh. The house is open to men and women and children three days a week and offers a range of activities and services. On Saturdays, the house is separatist and open for women and their children only in order to provide a safe space for refugee, migrant and trafficked women who are more vulnerable in the asylum system than men. Just like in any other home, everybody contributes to the daily life of Trampoline House. Together, asylum seekers and Danish citizens, refugees and other residents of Denmark organize legal counseling, language classes, cooking, cleaning, childcare, creative workshops, debate, campaigns and other activities. On an organizational level, Trampoline House is, as I said, a self-governing institution with a board of directors and a paid staff of six. Morten is the director, I'm, as I said, program blah 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 coordinator, <laughs> very long title. Uh, we also have a legal and job counseling coordinator, a fundraiser, a PR and communication coordinator and an administrator. Financial support to our administration and programs come from public and private funding, donations and fundraisers. In addition to the permanent staff, and this is key to the success of the house, Trampoline House offers internships and job training to 200 asylum seekers per year who are given two tra transport tickets, allowing them to leave the camps and come to the house <coughs> in return for interning in, for instance, the kitchen, a language class, or in one of our workshops. We also have 10 educational interns and 70 volunteers at all times, which is needed in order to run the house and its programs. The house has an average of 350 visits per week, counting asylum seekers, refugees with residence permit, citizens, regular and irregular migrants. We are the only asylum engaged project in Denmark with its very own permanent facility. And this is an overview of our activities and services uh, on a daily, weekly, monthly and yearly basis in 2016. <coughs> The American non-profit Mob Effect has uh, made a crowdfunding trailer for us which gives you a good sense of what everyday life in the house is like. If it would show up. Life in the camp, it's, it's horrible because four people live in the same room, share kitchen, share bathroom. Uh, it's isolated. It feels like a, a confinement center. There are a variety of people from different backgrounds with different problems and a very frustrated, stressful 
population in the camp. What happens to you when you live in a camp for too long is you get struck by poverty, um, isolation and victimization. It turns you into a client of the asylum system and eventually if you get asylum it will turn you into a client of the welfare state. Having uh, understood this it was inevitable that we had to come up with some kind of uh, antidote and this antidote is uh, the Trumpin house. The Trumpin house is my family, real family here. It's so nice for us as an asylum seeker because uh, being in the camp every day it's more stressful. Because you know in the camp we don't have life. So when you come to Trumpin house you come out of the society you meet uh, new people, kind of network, uh, learn about Danish, English culture, eat food together and so on. The Trumpin House doesn't see us as asylum seekers or refugees. They see us as humans. Humans with differences and humans with capacities. Everyone who's in the house, asylum seekers, refugees, Danes, everyone is looked upon and treated as someone who contributes to the house. And that pays off in the way that everyone here sees the house as their own. Today the government is uh, discussing the fiscal budget of uh, next year. It's expected that they will cut all the funding for extra activities for asylum seekers, which we have been a part of. Currently we provide transportation tickets to uh, 80 asylum seekers two times a week coming here to do internships and they stay uh, doing internships uh, for uh, maybe three months, maybe six months, maybe longer. So total in a year it will be 180 asylum seekers as it is right now. From the moment they enter this house they are part of this community and we respect them unconditionally. No matter their case we will work. Uh, with them and for them. We will not help them, but we will put them in a position where they can help themselves. Looking after something every week that you're able to get out, you're coming out to meet people, you're coming out to dance, to eat, to talk to people, is something very, 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 very important. And waking, waking up in the morning or waking up during the week, not knowing what to, what, what to look up to, is the worst thing you can ever imagine. So I think, looking forward, Come from now is the best thing that has happened with my one year in Denmark. I'm aware of time. <laughs> in uh, 2013, Frederike and I got permission from Trampolin House to rent three rooms in the house in order to establish uh, the Arts Center Camp. We inaugurated the space in April 2015 with the exhibition Camp Life. Camp produces two exhibitions per year with renowned international artists as well as less established uh, practitioners. We prioritize artists with a refugee or migrant experience. The center has taken its name after the refugee camp, asylum center, or detention center as the nation state's perhaps most extreme response to human migration. <coughs> Our inaugural exhibition, Camp Life, Artistic Reflections on the Politics of Refugee and Migrant Detention, showed projects by nine international contemporary artists and collectives who in different ways examined what kind of space the camp is which functions it performs, what po political juridical structures have made the camps possible, and what living in a camp does to the subjectivity, body, and souls of camp residents. Some works in the exhibition portrayed everyday life and the management of displaced bodies in Palestinian refugee camps, in Danish asylum centers, and in Australian detention centers. Other works went behind the facade of the camp to examine its logic 
as a site where a population is divided into two and the undesirables are placed. And still other works contextualize camp life and describe the flight routes that many refugees and migrants have followed prior to their detention in a refugee camp, an asylum center or a detention center. Half of the contributing artists and collectives were refugees themselves and have spent time in an asylum or detention center. For each show we do a video teaser. Uh, here's one documenting the Camp Life exhibition and its uh, launch party, which featured a fashion show titled If the Sea Could Talk by Rondon, artist, journalist, filmmaker, fashion designer, Daddy De Maximo. A fashion show honoring all the migrants and refugees who die each day on their way to safety and a better life. This exhibition tries to show the conditions of the Danish asylum system within the art context. And as a fashion design, I decided just to create a collection to pay tribute to the missing and uh, dead refugee. We've created five Gorilla Radio transmitters. So when you explore the different radio frequencies, you can tune in to, to different women's conversations on the conditions that they live in within the Danish asylum system. I was invited to show a film that I've made in the Amsterdam Asylum Camp about three African uh, asylum seekers and it's about waiting time and everyday life in the asylum camp. I use a life jacket with a barbed wire just to show that after to survive, they still also in prison because they sell them but they put them in camps. There are many problems about the asylum centers that I would hope would change, but I think one important step is that people know about what's happening in order to act. This is not how people have to live. skip a few slides because I'm running out of time. The second show was a solo show by one of Vietnam's most respected artists, Tiffany Chung, and investigated uh, different forms of displacement. Our third show was called uh, The Dividing Line uh, and uh, looked at the uh, border control and border crossing. Our fourth show, uh, called Deportation Regime, was a group exhibition examining practices and experienced, uh, experiences with forced deportation. And uh, this is one of the contributing artists, uh, Daniela Ortiz, a Peruvian artist, uh, currently a migrant in Spain. Uh, and for the opening event on September 9th, she presented a brand new performance piece called Shoes Sanguinis. During the performance, the artist who was pregnant at the time and a Peruvian immigrant in Spain had a blood transfusion from a Spanish citizen to question the legal principle Shoes Sanguinis, the right of blood, that gives citizenship to children born in EU territory only if the parents have citizenship and not according to the place of birth. Let me show you. And my residency permit expires the 8th of November of 2016. Due to the Spanish and European law and the use and guinea for my son or And 
my residency permit expires the 8th of November of 2016. Due to the Spanish and European law and the use and Guinea regime, my son or daughter will be legally considered an immigrant since the birth. My blood and the blood of my baby are not entitled for having the nationality. My blood and the blood of my baby are rejected by the Spanish and the European states. He is José Emiliano Quiroga. He is a Spanish and European citizen. He has direct right to the nationality when he was born. His blood is recognized as superior by the racist legal system. His blood gives him the direct access to the nationality. His blood is being transferred to me and... says uh, his blood is being transferred to me and my baby. <laughs> Our latest exhibition uh, was titled We Shout and Shout But No One Listens, Art from Conflict Zones, and it brought together an impressive group of international artists and thinkers to explore the leading cause of displacement, namely war. Taking its starting point in a number of contemporary and recent, recent conflicts that have been ignored by the international community, the exhibition presented installation, photography, painting, ready-made collage and performance work that examine war from the perspective of those trapped in or fleeing zones of conflict. I'm almost done. In camp, we make a lot of effort to communicate our exhibitions in a way so that our very diverse audience groups with very different cultural and educa educational backgrounds can all follow. All camp's exhibitions thus have wall texts, even though we're a super small space. All exhibitions are accompanied by a free online exhibition catalog available in Danish or English from CAMP's website. And CAMP also offers guided tours of all its exhibitions conducted by duos of non-refugee interns from CAMP and refugee <coughs> volunteers. The, the aim with having two guides to offer vis is to offer visitors an art historical analysis of the works as well as a migration political contextualization offered by the testimony of the Refugee Guide. We have also recently launched an art gallery guide program for asylum seekers and refugees who would like to become guides in camp. The program offers eight week long workshops in the spring and in the fall and prepare workshop participants for their role as art guides in camp's upcoming exhibitions and actively involve them in preparing a script for the guided tours. Next year we'll launch a new two-year exhibition program called State of Integration, Artistic Analysis of the Challenges of Coexistence. And uh, we'll work with the uh, four international curators and look into key concepts such as integration, assimilation, belonging, segregation, and citizenship. We will also open a new exhibition format called Open Camp, uh, a format that will allow us to respond more quickly to work we come across by less established artists, like the work of Pablo André you see here, an artist from Chile seeking asylum in Denmark, whose work we came, became familiar with because he joined the Gallery Guide workshop. In conclusion, we aim for CAMP to be a space where audiences, both with and without refugee and migrant backgrounds, are able to identify with the living conditions of displaced peoples, and through art to find inspiration for an alternative political agenda. On that note, 
let me let me end by returning to Omar Abdel Hamid Al Hussein, who I referred to in the beginning of my talk. I strongly believe that if he had had places like Trampoline House and Camp to go to, then maybe the Copenhagen shootings would never have happened. In these spaces, El Hussein would probably have felt seen, heard, understood, needed, empowered, full of agency, and part of a community. Because in these spaces, white privilege and structural racism are being challenged every day. This last short video clip from 2011 that I'll show now is made shortly before Trampoline House's one year anniversary and it spells out the main teachings of the house. That integration is not this difficult thing that populist politicians want us to believe. That if we work from a politics of sharing our spaces and in a broader perspective our countries, we can live together in peace and with respect. Thank you so much. Like in, a, in three weeks, this house is one year old, so we're gonna have a birthday party. It is about three years ago that we uh, got the idea to uh, create a camping house where people who live in the camps and dates could meet and, uh, and uh, build something together. No discrimination of social activities and social life. Life is just normal here. Yeah? Everybody is equal. And I get a haircut. And I think that that's what I hear from people in the trampoline house. So they say they, they had a very bad and negative impression of Denmark until they, they uh, heard about the trampoline house. And that changed the situation in many ways because it gives them uh, the chance to, to work and to do something and to be, to be talked to in respect and to, to be asked, what can you do? What are your resources? Is there something you want us to, to help you with or can you do something for us? house and participate in the various activities and be part and parcel of work that's happening in the house. Every Friday in this house we prove that it's possible and that uh, this uh, integration is not this big problem that the government told us. Actually uh, we feel that, uh, that we, have, uh, we have a model here which can be uh, Uh, it can be an example for the rest of the country. Thank you very much, Tuna, especially for bringing our attention to the consequences of the refugee crisis and to the challenges that many <coughs> asylum seekers face in, in Denmark and in, in Norway as well, I, I would assume. So, we have the time for a, a few questions. Yes? yes. Hi. Uh, I always use trampoline house as an example uh, for what you could call a real integration, which goes both ways, no? Both for Danish people and for immigrants, refugees, etc. I wonder if uh, you feel that your project uh, the, or the activity has an influence politically. I see there's some similar project in other countries, etc. But do you, do you see that it has an effect on politicians and that it creates ripple effects? Well, we're launching a new program now called Next Practice, uh, which is an idea to uh, argue that asylum seekers should be allowed to integrate from day one. So instead of storing people in the camps, uh, people should be allowed to uh, educate themselves uh, or get a job from day one, uh, learn Danish. Uh, and we're arguing that if people are allowed to do this, then they have better access, easier access to Danish labor market, the uh, Danish culture, uh, as opposed to waiting six years in the camp, not working, disintegrating, not learning the language, and then suddenly entering a three-year integration program where the social worker is saying, you have to find work now. 
So that's one way we're doing it. What Borden, the, the director, is very skilled at lobbying. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we are still here uh, after seven years. Like He's very skilled at the lobbying both with the, uh, our political friends in parliament and also our enemies uh, and trying to find a, a middle way. But we also work on a more activist base um, working with campaigns. Uh, we are supporting the, the hunger strike in one of the deportation camps going on right now. Um, and uh, I'm launching next month uh, a campaign to uh, improve uh, the rights for asylum-seeking children. I think actually we hope to turn that the last campaign uh, into a civil movement um, uh, because I think that we can bridge a lot of children's organizations, uh, children's rights uh, uh, activists, and even parliament on this issue that uh, children should not be placed in these new deportation centers and that children should not be born inside Danish asylum systems. <laughs> uh, so, so we're doing a lot of things at the same time. But uh, our experience is that if we had been uh, uh, stating from the start that we belong to the extreme left, we wouldn't have been able to accomplish anything. It is a delicate road of uh, lobbying and between right-wing politicians and extreme left activists who also claim uh, that the house is theirs. Any more questions? Comments? Well then I just want to say thank you for listening and just keep in mind that uh, this is a project made by ordinary people like you and me. That uh, there was not an institution who said we should do this. And I think that it is the specific uh, method methodologies uh, developed in activist art, uh, art feminism, um, uh, minority identity politics is what has informed uh, this space and has created a this notion of a shared space that I'm talking about. Thank you, and sorry for speaking so much. <laughs> Thank you so much.